We're going to start section 2.1, and we're going to finish it too. Um, this is the beginning of chapter 2, and in chapter 2, we're going to be taking a look at something called sets. Okay? So as we get started, we need to start with making sure that we all have the same vocabulary that we're using about the objects we're talking about. So that's how we're going to begin. A set is a collection of objects. It's kind of a vague definition, but that's what it is. And the objects that belong to the set are called elements. Now, the collection of objects, the set, can be any number of things. It can be a set of numbers, you know, a listing of numbers kind of thing. Uh, it can be a group of people, you know, your immediate family members. Uh, it can be uh, the books that are on your bookshelf that you're using this semester. Right? It can be any collection of objects, and the individual objects that we just listed are the elements. So the elements are the numbers, or the elements are the family members, or the elements are the books. There's three different notations that we're going to be using for sets. The first one's just a word description, so it's just going to describe it in words. Um, it's kind of cumbersome to sometimes like write it out, but it's very clear. Like, we know exactly what we're talking about, right? It's, it's English like, verbal words. Um, the second one's called set builder notation. I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, and the third one is called a listing method. So the listing method is where we actually list out each individual object in whatever category we're talking about, whatever set it is that we're talking about. Um, set builder notation is useful as a um, more concise way of listing everything out. That's the point of it. Now, as we start with the set builder notation, our first go at it is not going to look that good. By the end of class, we will come back to this and we will make it a little bit tighter, cleaner, and more concise. So I'm going to give you an example that we're going to start with, a verbal description. The example we're going to just start with is all whole numbers less than seven. Okay, so we're going to talk more about whole numbers and other numbers uh, as we move through the material today. But just as a reminder, real quick, whole numbers are the ones we count with, including the number zero. So whole numbers will start at zero, and they go from zero to one to two. Those are whole numbers. Okay. So I'm going to skip the set builder notation and jump down to the listing method because it's more familiar to us, and we'll start there. So if we're doing the listing method, we typically go from smallest to largest because our brains sort of organize information that way. And we would start with the smallest whole number, which would be zero. And the next one would be the number one. And then we'd have two. And how far will we go? Six, uh-huh. We will stop at six because it said less than seven. Right? Less than seven, so we'll stop at six. Now, that's fine if we have the numbers less than seven, but what if I said the listing method for the numbers less than 7,000? It's not so fine, right? So listing method works really well when it's a small grouping of something, when the set is small. Um, the set builder notation is a way to deal with this listing method, but in a way that allows us to use bigger sets. So it won't be particularly useful for this example, but I'm going to show you how it would look. You first draw your curly brace, and you do an X, and you do a bar. And I'll read what this is actually saying to you in a moment. For right now, just write it down. Curly brace, X bar. And then we have two descriptions that we need to make sure that we identify in here. One description is that we have to talk about the fact that it's whole numbers. It doesn't include negatives. It doesn't include fractions, right? So it's whole numbers specifically. And the other description is that we have to be, or be attentive to, is the fact that it's less than seven. So we want to make sure that we're on the smaller side of seven and not on the larger side. Now, in set builder notation, we usually do the inequality, or you see the inequality done first. So we will do x less than seven first. That's an inequality. You're familiar with those. After that, we have to talk about it being a whole number. And right now, we don't have all the tools we need, so we're just going to write down x is a whole number. And you're right that that doesn't look very concise. We will come back 
before we're done today and give this a more concise way of being written. But for now, that's what we have. Okay, all good? All right, so we're gonna do a couple of examples. Oops, they're on the bottom. No, before we do examples, I have the null set. Okay, one more, one more bit of ter terminology, the null set. The empty or the null set is the set that contains no elements. There's two different ways that you can write the empty or the null set. One of them is a zero with a line through it. That is not the number zero. That is the null set or the empty set. The other one is actually curly braces with nothing in them. It's an empty set. Uh, the curly braces mean that you've got a set, okay? So when we look at the set builder notation versus the listing method, the listing method is also a set notation. It's just not set builder notation. It's a listing method with sets, okay? So they're both, all of these are sets. They're just, just being described or, or represented a little differently. So the null set, um, the null set, an example for me, this may not be an example for you, so don't write it down if it's not, write something, just tweak it somehow. This would be, for me, uh, the, um, I wanted to use the same one I did before, infants, the infants living in my home. I don't have any infants in my house right now. They don't exist, okay? Oddly enough, um, my notes are old enough when I originally gave my example on here that it says the set of teenagers living in my house, which is kind of funny because it's been 10 years since I've had no teenagers in my house. That's how long this has it been. But I don't have any infants living in my home still uh, anymore. So the infants living in my home. Um, so when we talk about a null set, we're talking about something that it, it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that it's describing something that doesn't contain any elements, okay? All right, so let's do an example about some set. Oh, I'll take you back. Did I skip it? What happened? No, I did it. I just need to not flip my page, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna do a couple of examples, um, three of them actually, of some different sets and some descriptions. This first one asks us to list the elements of the sets and to do it in two different ways. It wants us to do it using set notation and then also set, it should say set builder notation. These are both set notations. So this should say set builder notation. So put that in there, please. Set builder notation. And then the other one says to do it with the listing method. So we're gonna do both of those ways of writing these sets out. Okay. So the first one is a description um, relating to numbers. It says it's a set of whole numbers greater than eight and less than 18. And I'm gonna do set builder notation and I'm also gonna do the listing method. I'm gonna start with the listing method because that's the one that's most familiar to you, okay? So we're going to literally list out all the values, the elements that fit into this description. So it says that they are whole numbers Okay, so no decimals, no fractions, right? That's what I'm saying. Whole numbers, and it has to be greater than eight and less than 18. What's the smallest one I'm gonna write down? Nine. And I'm gonna keep going up until I stop where? 17. 17. Okay, is that good so far? Okay, so remember set builder notation is the condensed form that's not looking very condensed this particular go around, but we'll later. So we write the, prac, uh, the curly brace and we do the X in the bar. I told you that I was gonna read it to you and then I never did. Um, we read this as X, the bar is read as the phrase such that. It's X, it's the elements such that they match the next criteria. This one says it's greater than eight and it's less than 18. So the smallest is eight, the biggest is 18, and X is in the middle. And since it says less than, we're actually going to do strictly less than symbols like this. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, is, is the direction correct? It is. Um, if X is greater than eight, then eight is less than X. Okay, that's why it's being written that way. We wanna put X in the middle with the smallest value beginning, the biggest value at the end. 
And then the part that's not particularly lovely right now is to say on the end what kind of numbers we're talking about, right? We don't want fractions and decimals. So we say x is a whole number. And we'll come back and give ourselves another version of this in a minute. Now, number two, set builder listing. What kind of numbers do you see represented on number two? Evens. They're even numbers, right? Um, and you might be looking at it and saying, isn't it already in listing method? And, and it is, except that it's not listed everything. So that's what we're going to do when we write the listing method out. Um, pay attention to the directions in my math lab. Sometimes it'll tell you things like you fill in the dot, dot, dot. And sometimes it'll tell you, know, so you just write the dot, dot, dot pieces down as the missing piece. Sometimes it wants you to write the entire set out from starting with 2 to ending with 22. So just pay attention to the directions. Um, this one's asking us to list them all. So we are going to start with 2. And we're going to list all the even numbers till 22. And we're all thankful that it didn't go to the bigger than 22 because this is quite a few at this point. There's, there's quite a few of them there. And for the set builder notation, we write x such that, right? The low end is 2, the upper end is 22, and x is in the middle. But on this one, we actually equal the 2 and the 22, right? They're in the set, so we're going to use less than or equal two signs. And then we need to specify that we're talking about just the even numbers so that we don't get like five, because five would be between those, but not the ones we're talking about. So we say x is even, or you can say x is an even number. Yes? Why don't we just say one is less than x and 23 is more than x? You could. Um, you definitely could. Nobody asked that in my last class, but it's definitely an option. So there's more than one way sometimes to do this. So I don't know if everybody caught what he's asking. Why do we want to use the less than or equal to's? Well, it's an option, right? We also could say 1 is less than x is less than 23, and that would be equally correct. Um, what you'll see happen often in my math lab is that they will give you multiple choice, and then they'll force you to choose one of those two, but both of them would be right. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I have one more example that at the moment feels a little bit funny, but again, we'll come back to this one and write it differently um, so you can see the connection later. Um, we're only asked to do the set builder notation on this one. Um, it says we're going to describe in set builder notation the set of all rational numbers. Uh, the reason it doesn't list or ask us to do the listing method is because it's not possible. You cannot list out the rational numbers. That's, that's silly. It's not a possible thing to list out. There's infinitely many of them, and we'll talk about infinite in a minute too. Um, so that's why that's not part of the directions. Um, so we're going to do x such that. And the only thing we can do right now is to sort of rewrite what we're already given. x is a rational number. And again, we'll come back and show another option for that before we're done. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're actually going to get a little bit more uh, symbolic terminology under our belts. We need a few more symbols, and we don't have them yet. Um, we also need to structure and remind ourselves of the structure of the real number system. So what I'd like for you to do is to draw a really large rectangle. You've got lots of space. I've got less on mine. And I'd like you to divide it into two pieces. They do not need to be equal divisions. In fact, you're going to need more space on one side than the other, not because it's truly bigger. You just need more space. And then we're going to embed inside of the larger part of my rectangle three smaller rectangles. So they're sort of looking like concentric rectangles. Something like that. Okay, so we're going to start our number universe 
with the rectangle that's in the middle, the tiny little one. Okay, that's our first starting spot. So when children, the little bitty ones, first start learning to count, what do they start learning to count with? One, and then two, and then three, right? They don't know anything about, they don't know anything about zero. Uh, they don't know anything about negatives. They don't know about fractions, and they certainly don't know about pi, okay? All those things are not in the world where we start. We start with this very little bitty picture of the world. And that's how life is anyway, in general. But it's definitely how our numerical life is in this particular example. So in the middle here, we have the numbers like we just listed. And I'm going to write them out, at least a couple of them. One, two, three, and so on. And these numbers are called the natural numbers or the counting numbers. And the notation for them is an N with a double line on the left. Now, when you see all of my things with these double lines, recognize that they all look a little bit different, just like my handwriting looks different than yours. When you see them in printed form, they look a little bit different. Sometimes they don't even double line them. Sometimes they just make them gigantic bold, uh, or they'll just embolden the part where I've written the double line. So those are some variations of how these will sometimes look. These are the natural numbers or the counting numbers. And we begin to expand our universe a little bit in pre-K to kindergarten, whenever we're starting to learn to do addition and subtraction, and we start to include the number zero. So once we include the number zero, we, are still all ha we still have all the other things too, the one, two, three. It's already inside the bigger picture, and our, wor our world just got a little bit bigger. So not only does it include the one, two, three, and so on, it now also includes the number zero. And when that happens, we call those the whole numbers with a W with a line on the left, extra line on the left. Okay, not necessarily in this order in terms of academics, but in terms of our embedded rectangles, the next one that we pass through is called integers. Now, integers are everything we already discussed, zero through you know, infinity, all whole numbers, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. But they also include the negatives of that. So we get negative one and negative two and negative three. And so adding to our idea of numbers, we get the negatives of the same things we've already had before. We call them integers. Integers is not I. It is Z, and that's Latin. I don't know what the word is, but it is from Latin, okay, for the Z. And then the outer rectangle encompassing these pieces at this point are rational numbers. So rational numbers include, again, the positives and the negatives and all the whole numbers we've listed. All the numbers we've listed are still inside of the rational number rectangle. But now we're going to include fractions and decimals, even repeating decimals. So we have things like 1 half and 9.5 and 0.6 repeating. All of those are considered rational. So why the word rational? Well, rational actually means that they can be written as a ratio. That's where the word's coming from, ratio. And it's a ratio of integers. So for example, the 0.6 repeating, another form of 0.6 repeating is two-thirds. Two-thirds is clearly a ratio of integers. You can do it with all the numbers that are inside this rectangle. You can do it with the three. It's a ratio of three to one. It's 3 over 1. Therefore, it is a rational number. Rational numbers are not an R. They're actually a Q. The Q is because of the word quotient. Quotient means division, right? Find the quotient. You're dividing something. And a ratio is a fraction or a division. So that's where that Q is coming from. Now, everything in the entire rectangle, both the part that I've worked with and the little part that I haven't, is considered the real number system, and that is R. Those are the real numbers. But there are some real numbers that we haven't talked about. The numbers that we haven't talked about are the opposite of rational. They're irrational, and that doesn't mean they're crazy, right? 
we joke about these numbers like this, kind of like, you'll notice we're not going to talk about imaginary numbers. It's, it's not a part of the real number system either. Um, so we use these words that have connotations in English that are not quite the connotations in mathematics, right? Irrational is one of them. Um, irrational does not have a closed form that's consistently used across all mathematics either. So what your book uses is they use R minus Q. In other words, it's the real numbers and remove the rational ones. Right? It's almost like you're cheating, right? You didn't create your own name. You just decided to borrow a couple other pieces. Uh, and the numbers that are in that category are things that I have mentioned. At least one of them is pi. Pi cannot be written as a perfect value as a ratio of integers. An approximation for it is 3.14 or 22 over 7, but that's not its actual value. It can't be written. Uh, another one, square root 2. All the radicals that are not perfect square roots or perfect cube roots would be in this category. Uh, another value that you probably have encountered is E, the natural base E. If you haven't encountered it, don't worry about it. But that's another one that fits in this category. So in every bit as much as it looks like there's a bigger rectangle on the left and there's fewer stuff on the right, it's actually reverse of that. There are infinitely many irrational and infinitely many rational numbers. But there are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers. Are there different values of infinity? Yes, there are. There are. Um, and that's another branch of mathematics. But just so you know, there are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers, and yet they're both infinite. So let's talk about how we count how many of these things there are and what that means. So cardinal number, or the cardinality, is the number of elements in a set. The notation of it is a notation that you've seen used in other forms of mathematics before. It's an n with a parenthesis around it. It doesn't mean n's being multiplied by something. And it's not function notation like in algebra either. Um, it's n, or the number of items in whatever set you're describing. All right, so if I did n of the people living in my house, the number right now is 6. You just count how many people there are in my house. That is the cardinality of the set, people living in Dr. Hans's house. My daughter might argue that the cats and dogs should be counted in there. I don't think so. She probably would. All right, so we're going to count some objects. The first one is a list of numbers. Now, when things are actually listed out and they're all listed, it's a really easy thing to do, right? N of the set, negative 3, negative 1, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. How many of them are there? Seven. We just count them up. There's seven of these guys. That's fine. Sometimes they put the dot, dot, dot. Now, this isn't very big. You could fill in the dot, 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 like we did on the 2, 4, 6, 8, up to 22. It would not be that bad. So let's just do that first. Like, think through it that way. Fill in the dot, dot, dot. Count them up. How many do you have? Ten. Yes, Autumn, thank you. It is ten. There are ten of them. It's small enough we can count it. It's no big deal. But what if this didn't say from 5 to 50? It said 5 to 22,968. 5. I got to end in 5 anyway. That's a different question, right? That's a different question. So if the numbers are too large that counting them up becomes impractical, I'd like to show you a shortcut or a reminder of a shortcut you've probably seen before. So what you do is you take the ending number, 50. You subtract not the beginning number, but the number in the pattern that comes before the beginning number. Now, that's not very exciting on this one. If I looked at what would come before 5 in this pattern, what would I get? It's 0. Okay? So it's not very exciting, but we could have started somewhere else. Agreed? And there would be a different number than 0. This one's a 0. And then you divide by what you're skip counting by. So this is every fifth number, right? It's multiples of five, okay? So we're skipping by fives. That's called skip counting if you haven't heard that before. 
So we divide by 5 because we're getting every fifth number. And sure enough, if you do 50 minus 0 divided by 5, what do you get? You get 10. And it works every time. Okay? Now, if the pattern doesn't multiply like this out, like if it's not every fifth number, this is not the way you would count them up. There would be other strategies. But this one comes up frequently enough that I wanted to mention it um, so that you have that at your disposal if you want to use it. Okay. So I mentioned earlier infinite and finite, and so we're going to take a look at that description. Um, a set is finite if the cardinal number is a particular whole number. It can be a big whole number, doesn't matter if it's big or small, but it's considered finite if there's a whole number that can be representing it. Infinite is a set that's so large it cannot be measured by a counting number. So these words finite and infinite here in terms of linguistics that you're familiar with are exactly what you're familiar with. They're not any differences, kind of like irrational and imaginary are. They don't work like that. They're actually what you mean in English. Let's take a look at number six. We've got a set. It's got a dot, dot, dot with it. Um, but it goes 6, 12, 18, dot, 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 42. Is this set finite or is it infinite? It's finite. Could you find the number of objects in it? Yes. Now, just if, if there, there can be finite things that are difficult to find the number of objects, this one would not even be difficult, right? It would look much like the last one I did with the 5, 10, 15, 20 ones, right? It would look much like that. Uh, this is finite. We could literally count this and find how many objects are in the set. Yeah, there's seven on this one. You're right. Okay, how about seven? Finite or infinite? infinite. It's infinite. Can you identify what's causing it to be infinite? It's the greater than 50 part, right? It's, it's unbounded. It doesn't end. So if I changed this and instead it said natural numbers less than 50, would it be finite or infinite? That would be finite. What if I changed it and I said the integers less than 50? That would be infinite. So why does natural numbers less than 50 create finite, but integers less than 50 wouldn't? Because that goes into the negatives. Yeah, it goes into the negatives. It's unbounded in the opposite direction, right? Natural numbers are bounded. They start at 1. But integers don't do that. They go further to the left along the number line. So there's multiple things you have to be paying attention to, not just the greater than 50, although for this one, that was the trigger, but also the type of number system that you're working in. Natural numbers, integers, what are we working in? Okay? All right. These are our last symbols that we're going to need in this lesson. This E, it's an E, looks kind of like a C with an extra line in the middle of it. It's not a boxy E, that means something different. Okay, it's not a lowercase E, also means something different. This is a set notation, and it means is an element of. And just like with the slash that's in the not equals to sign, right, makes it not equal, if we put a slash through it, it makes it not an element of. Intuitively, that's the same kind of, a, of an object. We draw a slash through it, it means not an element of. So the first thing we're going to do with these symbols is the examples below. But then we're going to use this symbol along with our symbols that we created for the whole numbers and the natural numbers and the rational numbers. And we're going to go back and we're going to make our um, set builder notation more concise. Okay, so first, this is a fill in the blank. You'll get these in your My Math Lab. They'll ask fill in the blank questions. And it's almost like a multiple choice because they'll usually give you, you know, like two options in this case, like this one. Is it an element of? Is it not an element of? Seven. Is seven an element of the set three, negative two, seven, and eight? 
It is. Okay, so what does it mean to be an element of? It means that this 7 is represented in the elements over here. Is it? Yes, it is. So this works. It is an element of. What if it had said 6? That one wouldn't work, right? Not an element of. Okay, so one of the things you should be looking for is, is it represented on the other side? But number nine introduces something that looks different. What is different on nine than on eight? There's curly braces or curly brackets around it. Like that obviously must mean something or I wouldn't be bringing it up, right? It does. It means something different than if they aren't there. So if they weren't there, let me just do an example below. If they weren't there and it just said three, would it work? Yeah, it would work. Okay. So this works. That's totally cool. However, when you put it into curly braces like that, it's no longer an element at all. Now it's a set. It's a lonely set, right? It's you in your dorm room when nobody else is around. It's lonely, but it's a set because of the way it's being represented, okay? So when it's got curly braces around it, there's no element symbol that will go in there because it's not an element at all. It doesn't even make sense to talk about it that way because it's no longer an element. It's a set, right? Is it a blue dog? Well, if it's not a dog, it doesn't matter if it's blue or not. It's not a dog, okay? So on this one, it's failing to be an element, but it doesn't fail to be an element in the same way that the six did here, right? It's failing because of the curly braces. Okay, now we have some symbols, and we're going to go back to the first place where we're going to use them, which is right here, notations. X such that X is less than 7. X is a whole number. And I'm going to do this. I'll do it in yellow so you can see it separately. X such that X is less than 7. All that's the same. Okay, that didn't change. We already had sort of shorthand notation for that. But what we get with our symbols now is a different way of writing out this long phrase, X is a whole number, and here's what it looks like. X is an element of the whole numbers. It's shorthand. That's the beauty of set builder notation, is that it's shorthand, right? So sometimes people dislike um, set builder notation uh, because it feels a, a little bit um, obscure, maybe. But you guys use shorthand all the time. Oh my word, get me out your phone. Seriously? How much shorthand do you use? I use a lot, and I'm not your age, right? Um, we use it in mathematics as well. Uh, multiplication is just shorthand. Multiplication is repeated addition. What is 3 times 7? It's 7 plus 7 plus 7. Why do we like it? Because we don't have to write out 7 plus 7 plus 7, right? We use shorthand in all kinds of stuff. This is shorthand for sets. Let's do another one. Uh, let's see. We have number one over here. So I'll move this down. So we can do x such that. We still have the 8 less than x less than 18. That's nothing different. But just like on the last one, we can say x is, oops, a whole number. Right? Um, there's no notation to make the even part. I don't have a set uh, that has a specific form's name, like whole numbers, natural numbers for even. So I can't fix that one and make it any shorter. It just is what it is. Uh, but I do have one more I can do, this one, the one that felt the most weird, maybe, in terms of, like, we didn't really write anything down that was super different than what it was already listing at. Well, we do have another way of writing it. It's x such that x is an element of the rational numbers. Any questions on that? Okay, we have one more thing on our docket for today, and that is set equality. Um, we're going to encounter two different definitions of set equality. One of them is in this section, and one of them is in another section in Chapter 2. Um, this section talks about um, it in this way. So a set A is equal to another set B if, number one, 
every element of A is an element of B. And number two, every element of B is an element of A. Is the element included in both? Okay. So in a practical sense, um, I'll use one of my um, in-laws' families as an example. Uh, I have a, a brother and sister-in-law, my husband's brother, and uh, my brother had a daughter before he married my sister-in-law. He had a daughter with his first wife, okay? So if my brother-in-law um, talked about his biological children, and his wife, my sister-in-law, talks about her biological children. They are not talking about the same set of children. Those sets are not equal. Because there's one person that's not in common to both sets. Okay? So set equality literally means that every object in one description is in the other description. And we've got an example of this um, on number 11. Okay? So... Um, on numbers 10 and 11, um, I'm showing you a different type of problem that you will see showing up inside of my math lab. You'll have true-false questions, okay? And obviously, if it's not true, it's false, and so you can fix it and you can get the answer right. I mean, like, you got five choices, chances, like, I, I get all that. Um, sometimes it doesn't give you as many chances as you want. It'll actually change the question on something, just FYI. It doesn't always give you all the choices. Um, but that doesn't really help you if you don't know why the false answer is false, you thought it was true and now you found out it's false but you don't know why kind of thing. So pay attention to what you're doing um, and make sure that you really understand when you're saying true or false and it's telling you you're wrong, what you forgot or what you mistakenly you know, thought. So on this one, it's asking us on number 10 to write if the following is true or false. Is six an element of the set containing negative two, five, eight, and nine? Is that a true or false statement? It is false. So it's not there, right? The six is not listed among those numbers. Therefore, it is not an element of the set. Number 11 is a set equality. It describes a set on the left, and it describes a set on the right. And we want to figure out if it's describing the exact same set. Are you with me? OK. So on the right, there's really nothing to decipher. It's pretty obvious. It's one and do, right? There's, there's nothing to figure out. But on the left, it's written out in a longer form, and we have to figure out what it's talking about. There's a couple of phrases in here that are important. Natural number is important, and less than three is important. If it says natural number, that's different than if it says whole number, right? Where do the natural numbers start? One. One. So if I'm trying to figure out which numbers it's talking about, I know it's not talking about zero. It is talking about the number one. What else is included in that description? Two. Two. Do we include three? No, because it said less than. I could say less than or equal to, but it didn't. So the description on the left is actually exactly the same objects as what is on the right. It's the same set. So they are, in fact, equal. These are equal sets, which makes my statement that I'm given a true statement. Any questions on that? Yes. 